Hello, everyone. And um, as you're coming into this webinar hosted by Labour Outlook, thank you for joining us on this rather cold Monday evening. Um, we've had an incredible response to this latest form in the Socialist Ideas series, over 500 pre-registrations. Um, and it's good to see you coming in on the Zoom now. I should also say at the start, if you miss any of it, it will be on our the Arise Festival, who kindly stream these events for Labour Outlook's YouTube channel afterwards. And the other thing I'll say is that if you're in your chat box, there will be a volunteer posting links throughout the discussion. That will include the PDF slides of Michael's presentation, which will also be shared on your screen and some other links to do with his work and the work we're doing as Labour Outlook. The format we have today on this important question of the economic crisis, what's Mark's right, is that we will have our speaker for around 25 minutes or so to introduce and then we'll have a number of rounds of questions. Um, in terms of your questions, the best way to get them to us is to put them in a Q&A box. We've got two volunteers in that box. And also, please let us know where you're tuning in from. It's always great to see where all around the advantages online forums, all around not only Britain, but even all around the world, where people are tuning in from. So please tell us uh, why you're tuning in in a Q&A box and where you're from. And also, as the discussion goes on, post your questions in there and we'll get to as many as possible. Um, so just to quickly introduce Labour Outlook, for those of you who don't know what it is, Labour Outlook is a daily web publication um, which brings you the best news and views from Labour's left and beyond. And as part of the political education work we're doing with that website, we have started doing these forums and we had a, a, a year or two of forums that were called Why Socialists and it was things like Why Socialists are Anti-Imperialists why socialists are anti-capitalists and so on. And now we're on the second of these series, which is the Socialist Ideas series. And today's is on the economic crisis, was Marx right? Um, and obviously as people tune in, you'll see all around us the crisis here in Britain, but also in so many countries, um, the economic crisis and the deepening of that crisis. And um, what we're looking to discuss today is how the ideas of Marx and Marxism as Nai Bevan once termed the most useful and strongest sort of collected body of thought that the Labour movement can use, how those ideas can help our what's going on and us understand it today, but also, of course, our actions in resisting it. So I think our volunteers are ready, and I think most people who have come into the webinar. So without any further ado, I'll introduce our speaker, it's economist, author, and regular blogger at the next recession, Michael Roberts. Over to you, Michael, and thank you for coming. Good evening, everybody, and thank you for inviting me. Um, we haven't got a lot of time, so it's going to be difficult to answer or deal with all the issues that Marx raises about our uh, modern society, and also, of course, when he was writing 150, 160 years ago uh, back then. In other words, the uh, what we have now, uh, a system of production and organization of humanity on the basis of profit, for a small group of people while the rest of us work for them, a capitalist system. Uh, now, Marx, in describing that system, raised a number of predictions, if you want to call that uh, what they are. And we'll have quickly go through some of these so that we can discuss whether he was right about his predictions. To do that, I'm just going to share a few slides and hopefully get the um, right one here. So, there's the subject, obviously, was Marx right? Um, we at Labour Outlook have emphasised the economic crisis. So I think we would start straight away by looking at the question of uh, crises in capitalism. One of Marx's predictions and explanations of what is going on was that the crises, that is the boom and slumps, the collapse in production, investment, employment, income, people losing their jobs, companies going bust, and yet uh, resources remain for people to, that they need, but they can't get them because they don't have the money to do so. These sorts of crises are endemic to capitalism. Now, according to the uh, view of the conventional economics and for uh, th those who represent our society today, the politicians, the economists, the officials, uh, that's not the case. Crises are not endemic to capitalism. Uh, the market economy, as they like to call it, works fine, but it comes into conflict, not with uh, something within the system itself, but is caused by rather bad policies, recklessness on the part of individuals, uh, wars that come from outside the 
economic system itself and natural disasters. And so it's not endemic to capitalism. But Marx's prediction and explanation of capitalism was that it was endemic to capitalism and there would be regular cycles of boom and slump recurring all over uh, the period in which capitalism had become the dominant uh, mode of production in society. He said this is a fundamental contradiction of capitalism because uh, what capitalism has is a contradiction between the need to develop the productive forces with the use of machinery and human labor against the fact that uh, that uh, relationship is organized on means that a small group of people control the, pr uh, the profits that come from that and make the decisions about investment and so on. So there's a conflict between social need and the private profit of a small individual. He called this collision between the production for profit and the creation of wealth, the basis of uh, the contradictions and crises that are, that are endemic to the capitalist system. And they're expressed in particular by a law that he liked to emphasize, the law of the tendency of the rate of profit to fall, which at a certain point profit starts to fall and the profitability reaches the point where it comes into conflict with the development of the productivity of labor and that leads to crises. So crises are the result of profitability falling over a time, which have to be corrected by the laying off labor, closing down companies, and trying to raise the profitability again. So we go through a period of boom, then slump, and then boom again. Is this true? Was he right about that? Well, here's a figure on the left-hand side I show you about the global rate of profit, which is um, being developed by a couple of academics in America. And here they show you um, taking about, I think, 40 countries where they've worked out the profits of each and they've uh, averaged that into some sort of weighted position. And you can see, just taking the period since the 1960s, if you like, that there's been a tendency for the rate of profit to fall over that period, over the last uh, 60 or so years. In fact, I could show you a graph that goes way back to show it continues further back into the 19th century. But what you can see here is it doesn't move down in a straight line. There are periods when the slumps take place. Those are little triangles S that I've got there. And every time there was a slump, then the rate of profit tends to recover because they've been able to reduce the cost by reducing the number of companies that survived and reducing the labor force and what wages they're paying them. So there's periods of recovery in profitability. But eventually, this law that Marx talked about dominates and drives down uh, profitability and eventually leads to further slumps. And as you can see at the moment, the rate of profit is probably at the lowest it's been uh, at least in the post-war period at the moment in this what I call this latter period of the long depression that we entered since the, uh, certainly since the end of the uh, Great Recession in 2008-9. And yet the mainstream economists and experts deny this. They say that there is no crises on a regular basis. These, I give you some quick quotes from Nobel Prize winners in economics who claim that there is no recessions, they've been solved, or when they happen, they're just a complete shock. A complete, the word shock is actually used as a technical term by mainstream economists, that shocks have taken place. In other words, everything's fine, and then we get the occasional shock. Uh, Alan Greenspan in 2008, who was the uh, Federal Reserve Chief, said that then, and he also said that what happened in the Great Recession of 2008-9, which is the biggest slump in the history of capitalism uh, that we've seen up to now, apart from possibly the pandemic slump we've just had, that it was a chance event, a 100-year event, bringing together a perfect storm of certain forces out of the control of the economy that produced the slump. Nothing to do with capitalism itself. A random event, an unknown unknown. We don't know what causes recession, said another Nobel Prize winner. Uh, we've never known, and we're not very good at explaining the swings in economic activity. So we just ignore that they happen. And so when you think about the situation at the moment in the British economy and internationally, when they, we are impending another slump, we're not really told the reasons for this slump. It's happening. Uh, all we have to do is pay the bill and expect, uh, hope that the economy recovers again and people get their incomes and jobs back after a slump. Uh, yep with no attention attempt to solve the problem by explaining what's happened. So in my view, Marx has been proved completely correct about the nature of uh, capitalist growth, that it's not in a straight line upwards for everybody. It's a series of booms and slumps and crises. In fact, getting worse as we go into the 21st century. 
The other great prediction of Marx was that there will be continued, uh, capitalism will continue to breed inequality and poverty across the board. Poverty has always been with us as human beings in uh, uh, more societies going back in, into thousands of years, but that poverty hasn't always come accompanied with a huge inequality until we got towards the more modern societies, commercial, uh, agricultural, and uh, merchant societies of the 18th, 17th, and 18th centuries. But in under capitalism, there has been no improvement in inequality and poverty, despite the claims of uh, the proponents of capitalism. Poverty is poverty rising or falling? Well, it's never been so high, as I'll explain shortly. Is inequality of wealth and incomes rising or falling? Yes, between countries, it's never been so great. And even within countries, particularly uh, in our advanced capitalist economies like Britain, the United States, we've never seen such a wide degree of inequality of wealth uh, for over 200 years. Is life expectancy rising? Well, in the last few years under the pandemic, it's beginning to decline in the case of uh, the major economies. Here's a figure produced by Credit Suisse in the United Nations on the state of inequality in the world. 1% own nearly 50% of all the personal wealth in the world. So that's that little group right up at the top there, that tiny top of the pyramid there, uh, just a small number of people, um, just 33 million, sounds a lot, but that's that 33 million control 45 to 46% of all personal wealth. Down the bottom here, three and a half billion people or 73% of the world's adult population get just two percent to just over two percent of the world. That shows how deep the inequalities are in modern capitalism. So Marx's prediction about poverty and inequality remain. Are about 4.2 billion people today live in poverty. That's up one billion in the last 35 years. So of a population of near eight billion, and that includes all the children, uh, around about half, including the children, live in what the World Bank considers poverty. And by the way, the World Bank's measure of poverty is so, so low, you wouldn't believe it. It's just about $2 a day. Uh, even at $10 a day, uh, the poverty levels are still absolutely huge. Um, the other predict another prediction that Marx made, to say whether he was right, that there'd be, as we increase the technologies, capitalism in uh, is a system by which it drives towards introducing machinery to reduce the amount of labor it wants to uh, spend money on, uh, to increase the productivity of labor through technology and machinery. Would that produce more prosperity for everybody or would it bring more exploitation? The answer in some ways is both. It produces more prosperity for capitalism because it increases the productivity of labor uh, as they introduce machinery. And of course, in the 21st century, we're talking about uh, artificial intelligence and robots and so on, but it also increases exploitation. The share of that extra productivity increasingly goes towards the owners of capital and not to uh, the workers producing uh, that, that, that new, new value um, and are being forced to work for those who own the capital. Here's a figure which shows over the last uh, 50 years, the decline in labor share in uh, most economies on the right hand side, you can see the share out of the total value being produced has gradually declined. And it goes with the, the steady decline uh, in the cost of moving into machinery rather than labor. Uh, Mark Carney, who was used to be governor of Bank of England said, uh, Marx is right. If you substitute platforms for textile mills, machine learning for steam engines, Twitter for the telegraph, and you have exactly the same dy dynamics as existed 150 years ago when Marx was scribbling uh, the Communist Manifesto. And so the prediction that Marx made that technology would increase the productivity of labor, but also increase the exploitation of labor uh, is borne out by the last 150 years experience and will be increasingly so over the next generation. The other thing is, with this, capitalism causes wars. That's one of the things that both Marx and Engels emphasized the intense competition between capitalist countries and states would increase the danger of wars of the drive to make more profit, gain more control of markets around the world. Uh, the view of uh, uh, conventional economics and politics is that wars aren't the result of any drive to control profits and markets and so on. They're all about results of bad people, whether it's uh, Hitler, whether it's Stalin, whether it's Mao, whether it's uh, Putin and so on. 
It's bad people that cause wars, not the co intense conflict between capitalist states and capitalist companies over the control of the world's resources. And yet, if you look at the, uh, the way in which the world's resources are and power is controlled, you can see that there are a small group of countries in the world which dominate uh, both the GDP, which is the blue block here, uh, the uh, foreign investment, the investment in countries around the world, the banking system, uh, the control of the currency, and above all, of course, uh, the size of a military force. The United States is the dominant imperialist power in the world and drives most conflict when it comes to war in the world because it has the largest amount of military and economic and financial power compared to any other country. Uh, if you want to compare that to, say, Russia down the bottom here, uh, Russia may be the issue of the day, but in terms of uh, its political, economic and military power, it's a nothing when it comes to the major uh, capitalist economies, which are on the left-hand side of this graph. And in fact, the US military has conducted activities in 76 countries, 39% of the world's nations, and it's being accompanied by these operations, according to Brown University, uh, in violations of human rights and civil liberties across the board. Something like half a um, million people have been killed in post 9-11 wars in Afghanistan and Pakistan, and of course, even other half a million in Syria. This is just an example of way in which wars are related, in fact, to the military, economic and financial power of the major imperialist powers. Now the prediction of Marx, capitalism is destroying the planet and will destroy the planet. And that uh, that's the real danger ahead. It's not just a question of the increased exploitation of working people, uh, the increased exploitation of poorer countries by richer capitalist economies, imperialist economies, but also the planet itself, the environment and the, uh, the natural nature and the other species in the planet. And Marx made a number of points like this, as, as did Engels, which have been revealed in actually more recent uh, publications of uh, those that work, which hasn't been well known before. Uh, the view of conventional economics and politics is, well, climate change might be an issue, uh, pandemics, well, maybe, but these are chances, or they're not even man-made, they're nothing to do with capitalism itself, they're to do with humanity's bad attitudes rather than capitalism itself. But capitalism is destroying the planet, as we know. Here is the, uh, just a straightforward account of the huge increase in carbon emissions now taking place, driving up the warming level globally now to well above anything that to, uh, would protect the planet. Increasingly, we're entering tipping points where we're going to get more uh, disastrous weather, and uh, droughts, floods, and so on, and the the loss of life and living for uh, probably millions, if not hundreds of millions, over the next generation, if not something is not done. And of course, increasingly, we're getting serious and dangerous, uh, dangerous pandemics uh, with uh, weird um, and dangerous uh, pathogens appearing in, in human uh, society for the first time as a result of the expansion of capitalism into the most remote areas of the world through uh, timber logging, mining, exploration of oil, fossil fuels, and uh, urbanization, with no attempt to control that, and the damage that's causing to nature, and the opening up of contagious viruses affecting humanity itself. More is to come. Uh, COVID is just one of many path uh, pathogens that have been released over the last uh, 40 years, and the worst may come over the next generation, unless we have the end to capitalism. That prediction is a prediction that was made also by Marx and Engels back 150 years ago, that there will be increasing problems for the environment and nature as a result of capitalism. One big prediction of Marx was that class struggle was endemic. It was endemic in all previous societies because in all previous societies, except the very early stages of humanity, uh, a small group, a class, an elite were able to control the surplus and the land and the other uh, means of production which existed in those societies while the majority were not. And that's how you've got kings, popes, and all kinds of other uh, elite groups that controlled the world. Class struggling, class struggle, therefore, according to Marx and Engels, was endemic, and that uh, this has continued as a different way 
under capitalism, but it's still there in a strong way. The basic struggle between workers, people trying to make a living uh, beyond the bare necessities, and the small group of people trying to stop them making that living and taking the bulk of those resources, as we've seen in those figures. So there's a class struggle continues. That cannot go away. It's endemic to capitalism, Marx and Engels predicted. Uh, the view of the conventional economics and uh, modern uh, strategists of modern society is that there are no classes. They've all disappeared. Everybody's really middle class. There's no real difference. And if they're differences, they're not over classes. They're over individual matters or matters that are to do with not to do with classes, like uh, genetic factors or uh, other factors of that nature, and that therefore uh, Marx's prediction of endemic class struggle and that uh, that would be part of a major part of capitalism has proved to be wrong. Well, I think the evidence stands against that view. But it's still the case that class struggle is endemic to capitalism. Perhaps the biggest thing we have to think about is that Marx claimed that capitalism is transient. By that means, it's not the best that humanity can do, which is what the view we have at the moment, uh, from the, the conventional sources, the consensus. It is a system that is so divided, divisive, so damaging to the development of humanity, and also unable to take productive forces at a certain point, that it's a danger of breaking down altogether. Now, it would break down perhaps in the direction of being replaced by a new system, which was better, a new so social system organized by humanity, or it would just break down and we return to a worse position, an even worse situation going backwards in terms of technology, productive forces, and people's life expectancy and human condition. But the argument was, and the prediction was that capitalism is transient. This is something perhaps we could discuss because capitalism is still with us. So was Marx wrong to say that capitalism is transient and won't last? Uh, will it be here forever? It is at the best possible uh, system in the best possible of all worlds. In my view, everywhere, that argument that it could last is getting more difficult to, to justify. As again, I remind you of the falling rate of profit. That means that profitability, as it goes down, is more and more difficult for capitalism to expand the productive forces, meet people's social needs, raise uh, living standards, maintain high levels of life expectancy and uh, human development. The more and more difficult, the struggle, the intense struggle between the owners of capital and those of us who just don't own anything but have to work for a living is becoming more intense because profitability is in, in difficulty for the, for the owners of capital. So another prediction, of course, for Marx was unless we moved on to a revolutionary change, we couldn't reform capitalism. That was his prediction. Uh, we have to have a revolutionary transformation of the means of production, mode of production into something new. The first condition of the transition then to what he would like to consider as communism was the political liberation of the working class through democracy. Uh, that's his way of describing revolution. And that meant first and foremost, control of finance and communications by uh, the public, public ownership of key, key means of production. I'm reading a list here, which comes from the Communist Manifesto. Pro progressive taxation, we would now say the end of tax havens in modern society, public works and services, the leveling up of incomes and geographically as well between countries and free education, health, communications and transport. These items are more or less in, in the Communist Manifesto written now something like, um, what is it, uh, 75 years ago. So socialism means uh, not an autocratic dictatorship, which we're uh, told by modern uh, strategists that socialism means Stalin, socialism means uh, dictatorship, socialism means people have no freedom of speech or action and so on. Uh, that's not what Marx meant by socialism predicted would happen. It would mean common ownership and the end of private property. It would mean no state though, that <coughs> we would do away with armies and armed bodies of men within our society as we'd be able to meet the needs of the population as a whole, there will be no need for state oppression of the population. No oppression of women, no oppression of nations, races and creeds, the ending of nationalism, the ending of private property in, in effect restores hu human freedom as social. Let me finish on a couple of quotes from <coughs> 
two great um, socialists that probably we don't realize that uh, were socialists uh, and back up what Marx was saying about this is the way forward for human development. As Albert Einstein said, I'm convinced there's only one way to eliminate these evils, namely through the establishment of socialist economy, <clears throat> accompanied by an educational system oriented towards social goals. And the real purpose of socialism is to overcome and advance beyond the predatory phase of human development, which you are still in. And <clears throat> finally, a little word from Oscar Wilde, from the soul of man under socialism, with the abolition of private property, then we shall have a true, beautiful, healthy individualism. Individualism returns. Nobody will waste his life on accumulating things and the symbols of things. One will live. Most people exist at the moment. That is all. What we need, as Marx said, is an association of and free development of, of people. So that way that the individual will develop as a condition of development of all, and that the happiness of the individual becomes inseparable from the happiness of all. Thank you, guys. Thank you, comrade, and what an interesting um, discussion. Thank you so much to everyone who's joining us, and please do put your questions, but also your comments in the Q&A box. People who've come on these before will know that I like to read out where people are from. Um, and we had over 500 registrations in advance today, so it's great to see so many different people here. We've got in no particular order, Northton, Tyneside, St. Ives, Michigan, Marlow, Goulston, Islington, Spain, Heathley, Wanstead, Milan, Preston, Christchurch, I don't know if that's New Zealand or here, Peckham, <laughs> Manchester, Leeds, Doncaster, California, Downsford, Suffolk, Leicester, Aberdeen, Warrington, Kilburn, Leamington Spa, Slovakia, Eltham, North Shield, Stroud, Oxford and Edinburgh. So that's a great uh, mix of people. And thank you, everyone, for putting where you're from in the Q&A. Something that I'm also going to do, as well as questions, is read out your comments in the Q&A. Um, so just to say, for example, we have a comment here from Gary. He says that Marx expected revolution. He had no idea of the bread and circus effect of modern communication. Look at TV, social media, etc. Now, I've got a lot of questions coming up in front of me here, Michael. So what oh. I'm going to try and do is thema thematic them a bit so that we can do a section, for example, on questions that specifically relate to Britain um, and the economy here, a section of what I call more sort of general questions about whether Marx was right or wrong, and then others. <laughs> I think I'll do it. So on the more general ones, following up that comment I just said from Gary, namely Marx expected revolution, but he had no idea of the bread and circus effect of modern communication, TV, social media, etc. He then asked, how does revolution occur when everyone is made facet from above, by the above rather? And um, then there are other ones which I think link to this, which is from Ben on Facebook. There's one saying, is Marxism still relevant in the digital age, which is kind of related? Um, and then one that I think also, this is definitely not an easy one, um, links to this, but in a more sort of positive, when we're talking about society to the future, from John van der Vert, I hope I pronounced that right, on Zoom, who says, what is the role of culture in the development and evolution of socialist reconceptualization of the social and economic order? But the reason I'm putting that in there with it is because I think questions to the media are kind of linked to questions of education and culture, like Einstein was saying in that quote. So I'm going to um, kick you off with them, Mark, and we'll see where it goes. Well, I think it's a very good first question, because uh, perhaps the one area where Marx is wrong, <coughs> or you at least say wrong up for now, is that if revolution is necessary, we, we haven't had one which has transformed uh, humanity into the sort of social society that um, both Einstein and Oscar Wilde were presenting to us and Marx himself, and that <laughs> revolution has fallen short of that. And in fact, if we look at the time when Marx was around, he was perhaps very optimistic about the possibilities of working people getting together to organize a revolutionary transformation. He, perhaps uh, about every 10 years when there was a slump, uh, forecast such a revolutionary move. That didn't prove to be the case <coughs> on most occasions. Although, of course, we have had revolutionary changes. The Paris Commune lasted about uh, three months. <coughs> the um, October Revolution in uh, Russia led to the setting up of Soviets or workers' councils and the basis of uh, a revolutionary change, which ended the 
capitalist mode of production, but we haven't got time to go into what happened to that. But clearly, uh, there was a revolutionary change to begin with. And we've seen similar sorts of uh, transformations in the sense of capitalism being removed as the mode of production, at least for a period of time around the world. But we haven't had that major transformation into the development uh, and transition towards a social society we've, talk, we've talked about. Now, is that because Marx was wrong about um, revolution or was he also wrong about the ability of the working class as an agent to bring about the change that was required to improve uh, humanity's prospects over the next uh, century? Uh, I still think it's the case that the working class exists as a class. Uh, the vast majority of working people are now not in the advanced capitalist world. Uh, of the, <clears throat> say, three and a half billion people who work, uh, the vast majority are outside of the major imperialist powers in Europe and North America. They're in what we like to call for shorthand the global south, where there's a massive uh, proletariat, to use the old word for working class. Uh, particularly in countries like India and Africa and other parts of Asia, Latin America, and of course, China. These are huge uh, working class dominated countries where manufacturing and industrial production goes on apace as it did in the 19th century and into the early part of the 20th century in the more advanced capitalist economy. So the working class hasn't disappeared. Class struggle continues. Uh, the a development of struggle to try and change society, in my view, uh, also continues, but it depends very much on a number of factors. What's happening objectively? What's happening to the world economy? Are the conditions uh, uh, changing, which force people to consider a big drastic change? And is that what we used to call in uh, Marxist terms as an objective factor? Are there organizations of the working class that have got a clarity and a view about how to go in that direction? Uh, the other part of the question was the digital workers. Oh, yes, we're in the 21st century where increasingly uh, workers are not uh, dealing with uh, making things. They're dealing with producing ideas or, uh, how do I put it a different way, uh, processing ideas uh, in digital format, not on paper anymore, but on screens like this while we do the Zoom. And we saw during the pandemic that large sections of the population ended up uh, working from home. Uh, and uh, workers were doing using Zoom and other ways in which to communicate with each other and also do their work. And increasingly, a lot of the work is just producing uh, digital programs and other forms. Uh, and that's increasingly been the case. Does that mean that the working class is no longer a working class or uh, has the ability to struggle and change? I don't think so. I think uh, we've, a lot of studies have been done. Digital workers are still workers. They're still producing value and surplus value and profit for capitalists when they go to work. There's no difference there. Can they organize together? Well, we shall see. In many cases, that is in, I think that will be increasing the case over the next uh, 10 to 15 years. We will see workers organizing, uh, digital workers organizing, perhaps through the media as we see it now, uh, uh, precisely in the way that we're conducting this uh, meeting today. Thanks, some great thoughts there. Um, I've got a very wide range of questions coming in. I think we could uh, we could go around the world as well if we wanted to. I'm just going to quickly call in now um, Ben, Ben, our volunteer, um, who's just going to okay. say a minute or two about Labour Outlook and ask for your donations. Um, over to you, Ben. Thank you. Uh, I am. Thanks, Matt. Uh, yeah, so I'm Ben. I'm a, I'm a volunteer with Labour Outlook. Um, I want to thank everyone for coming again. This Socialist Ideas series of events is, is really attempting to open up discussion on deeper themes around the economic crisis and the solutions we can advocate. So I hope you're enjoying it and there's more to come this evening. But this is our regular reminder that these events are all run by volunteers. We're totally reliant on donations to put on these events. Um, as we always do receive great support from our attendees, uh, we must be getting something right uh, or offering something that others aren't. Um, so I just quickly want to ask you three things and hopefully there's going to be a a link appear in the uh, the chat as I do so. But if you can, it'd be great if you could donate perhaps ten pounds on our or on our donation link. Um, this will help cover the costs of hosting the forum, of the the email servers, the Zoom costs, the streaming costs. Um, so if you could donate something like that, ten pounds or twenty pounds or whatever you can afford, that would be great. Um, now, obviously, Labour Outlooks uh, it's got new content appearing every day. We're trying to do at least uh, the basics and or just start countering the 
the billionaire owned press with an outlook for progressive voices. So uh, please think about becoming a Patreon member for, for Labour Outlook. Um, that will give us a regular small donation and help build a platform for the left and for movements of resistance against against the Tories. So thank you if you can do that. And there should be a link for the Patreon uh, account in there. And just to say, um, obviously, we're going to keep doing these events. And the next one coming up, the next Labour Outlook Forum is the uh, is a look at Iraq 20 years on, how Bush and Blair's imperialist war devastated a nation. Uh, and that's on the 29th of March in the evening. Uh, and there should be a registration link uh, available as again in the chat. So if you could do any of those and just to, I guess a final plug as well, if you could do a, a one off donation, that would be really appreciated. Um, but we'll I hope you hope you enjoyed the discussion tonight. I'm sure we've got loads more questions coming in to Matt, uh, and we'll see you at the next event as well uh, after tonight. So there you go. Thank you, Ben. And um, I can see three or four donations coming up on my screen right now. I always have the PayPal open to see if see if people are giving in. So thank you to Pam and Jan who have given, and to everyone who does. Um, our next round of questions. I'm going to go specifically onto stuff about Britain at the moment, just because there's a lot of questions on that. Um, so the first one related to, is neoliberalism seriously different from previous forms of capitalism? And do we need different ways of overturning it? And that relates to another question which has come in, which is sort of, and I'm paraphrasing without any swear words, um, why does the British economy seem to do so much worse than the other sort of imperialist economies? Or, or, or why are we in such a mess? I suppose this is a nice way <laughs> of saying it. Um, then I've got some questions on sort of potential policies out of it as well, which is um, one here on how, would, how could a wealth tax be introduced? Would that help stop the poor getting poorer? And is redistribution of wealth attainable? And then related to that one that sort of basically says, is demanding taxing the rich or, you know, taking inequality for tax, is that a sort of basic change or does that actually infer systematic change, which is related to that? And then this one, I think, was on a theoretical point you made, but it's relating to Britain, so I'm going to put it in this batch as well as one, two more things here now. This one from Priscilla on Zoom is, if there is no state, how could we, for example, have a national health service? And we need soup for regional services, surely. They cannot all be local. National services are key. And then um, the last one, which I isn't specifically saying it's in Britain, but I think is relating to the recent developments we've seen at the top of both the Tory and the Labour parties. And it's from George, our good friend Georgia Plackman in, um, from Labour Left in the East. And um, her question is, what would Mark say to our modern deference to the markets? And the personification of capital, which I suppose is, um, I think we can get what she's getting at after all the stuff around this trust. So I'll throw all, all of them at you, Michael, and then we'll see how we go after that. OK, let's start with neoliberalism. I mean, I, I agree with the question of that uh, neoliberalism is often bandied around as though it was something different uh, that, that's, uh, that's really changed the fundamental structure of capitalism. If it's if it's bandied around in that terms, I don't think that's correct. Uh, it's capitalism is a system of the pr production for profit by the owners of capital, the means of production, and they employ the rest of us to produce uh, the value of things and services that are sold on the market so that they can appropriate the profit from that while we receive wages. That basic structure of capitalism hasn't changed under neoliberalism, and it's existed before neoliberalism. Nothing has changed there. If, if we're saying, on the other hand, that there's a change in the policies of governments, and that particularly from the 1980s up until recently, in that the aim of governments has been to crush and reduce uh, the public sector, uh, privatise, to destroy trade unions, uh, to globalise the economy, taking uh, jobs and uh, machinery and the rest of it abroad in foreign investment, uh, deregulating the economy so capitalists are not controlled in any way, then there certainly has been those trends and changes and the development of the financial sector in particular over the last 40 years. Uh, the reason for that, if you want to call that neoliberalism or return to a liberal economy with no regulation, no controls, no trade unions and so on, is because capitalism, as you've seen from the 
graph that I was showing you before, got increasingly into difficulty, particularly in the 1970s on profitability, and they were forced to reverse the previous policy of making concessions to working people, allowing a certain level of welfare state, allowing trade unions to exist. They reversed those policies because they had to, because profitability was going down and they had to reverse uh, which direction the profitability was going. So in the neoliberal period, as we call it, between 1980 up until the Great Recession, if you like, was a period when profitability was driven up, at least only a little bit, uh, through at our expense across the board. So in that sense, neoliberalism is a different period, but the nature uh, of structure of capitalism hasn't really altered. Why is Britain the worst of the capitalist, major capitalist economies? Well, I think one of the main reasons, and if you go on my blog, you will see a lot of, if you search under Britain or under productivity or something, you'll find answers to that question in a number of posts I've made. But the basic thing is that British capital lost its hegemonic, its dominant position at the end of the 19th century up to the First World War, as rival capitalist economies are developed in the United States and in Europe, Germany and France and so on in the interwar period, uh, it lost further, uh, and in particular, Britain became increasingly uh, a capitalist group that was not interested in expanding the productive sectors of the economy, manufacturing, technology, uh, science, and so on, services. Yes, you had scientists, but it didn't develop those things. Those things went, uh, those discoveries usually ended up in the hands of the Americans or Europeans, and it concentrated on becoming a financial and property-based economy, uh, what we used to call a rentier economy. In other words, they're more interested in getting rents out of the rest of the world than making profits through productive investment. And so the British capitalist class became a, if you like, a semi-parasitic class on the rest of the world, operating uh, uh, on the behalf of the Saudis on oil, or the Europeans on investment and so on, to spread around uh, uh, investments and taking their cut uh, through the city of London. That sort of economy is bound to be in difficulty when capitalism gets into difficulty itself. And we've seen in particular in this recent period uh, where it's lost its position even more uh, as even the dominant financial uh, capital of the world. And it's lost its position in trade and elsewhere. And so its productivity levels have dropped dramatically. It's losing its share of world markets and increasingly it's, uh, entering a period where it has a series of crises. Every slump that we will see from now on, the UK will be the worst uh, sufferer of the major economies. Uh, can we reverse that? Is taxation enough? Well, for a start, I'm in favour of increasing taxation on the rich. How can anybody in the Labour movement not be opposed to that? We must be uh, aiming the massive and grotesque amounts that the very small number of people are making uh, from their position uh, in wealth and so on, in property and finance and so on, uh, and using that power and property and finance to uh, squeeze the rest of us through political activity, controlling uh, our democratic institutions and so on. We need, yes, a wealth tax would be a very important uh, development forward. Uh, I can remember that uh, when I was much younger, in the 50s and 60s, or certainly then, that we had a much higher level of taxation of the corporate sector, of uh, the very rich. Uh, we didn't have a wealth tax, really except the inheritance tax, but all those are now at least enabled some more money to be redistributed towards uh, services and the uh, lower income parts of the population. That's all been wiped out over the last 40 years. A, a very small level of wealth tax on the very rich will produce billions, billions that could easily cover the gaps that we're seeing in the National Health Service and education and other public services. And, and so very much in favor of that. All I would say is, that uh, by attempting to introduce that, you're going to have a major struggle uh, from the reactionary forces in this country, from the Tories, from the people behind them, the media and so on. The struggle just to introduce a wealth tax is almost, it almost produces a revolutionary situation. So serious uh, would it be seen uh, by the ruling class. So in many ways, we have to remember that taxation uh, that redistributes from the rich to the poor is something we want. But in order to do that, we may actually have to change the whole structure of the economy. We may have to take uh, over the major sections of the economy in order to actually achieve a tax on, on the richest part of the population. And in such a position, 
we do need control by uh, the public organizations, the state, if you like, through democratically run by working people in order to establish things like the health service. I'm not in favor of getting rid of the H NHS because we don't have a state. I think it's, let's put it the other way around. A health service where is, must be a universal service. It must be run by the public as a whole. Uh, it must be free at the point of use and that we need organizations of the state to ensure that that happens and it's run properly both at national level and at local level through democracy. And that seems to me uh, a, a combination between the need for uh, workers having control of the major sectors of the economy in order to carry through uh, state-led investment in the interests of, of the people. And certainly not in the interest of the market economy. When people say the market economy is wonderful, Marx's reply to that was, well, how vulgar can you be? How, how lack of understanding of can you have about the nature of our society to say that there's some sort of market which works perfectly in equilibrium and never causes any inequality and, and uh, disharmony or booms or slumps? That's what he called vulgar economics. And that's what we still have to listen to every day in the media. Thank you, everyone. Um, I'm going to sort of move to more global questions now, I think. Um... And I'm going to paraphrase some of these, not because I don't want to ask people's full questions, but because some of them linked a bit and I'm going to try and merge them. So there's two or three questions about China. Um, one asking what you think of recent developments regarding China, which I presume is linking to some of the material you've written on the changes in COVID policy and the recent economic policy changes at the governing party's Congress. Um, someone else asking how we define China. Is it typically capitalist? Is it socialist or something else? Um, I think when this came up before, me and you agreed on it, Michael, which is quite rare at one of these meetings. But anyway, <laughs> we'll see. Um, and then linked to that, though, because obviously the rise of China is a um, is a major part of the move towards a more multipolar world. So I've got someone asking about if Russia's economy is weak, how is it so strong in terms of how it's perceived in the neighbouring states? And I suppose asking back to the Iron Curtain days. Um, I've got someone asking about the influence on the sort of struggle for a better world on the US's deficit problem and how this relates to the rise of China. And then I've got um, someone saying, does a multipolar world, does the rise of nationalism in the multipolar world help us working for socialism or hinder it? And linked to that, I think I've got a couple of questions about Latin America, which we can't go into in any detail, but some good points about changes being made in Latin America for the better and resistance against imperialism, but also how the US always sort of slaps back against that through coups and so on. And then um, someone specifically asked, Petter Dan asking, again, relating to the global situation, and the role of the US, we're always told the USA gains advantage with the dollar as the world's currency. Yet in your chart, the bank's share was not the highest in the USA. Can you say some more on that? So I think to really paraphrase, we're sort of asking about um, the moves towards the multipolar world, how the US is decline relates to that and whether that makes it easier or harder to move struggle forward in the um, in the globe. I think that I am paraphrasing dramatically here and um, people are commenting on that, but I think that's sort of roughly where we're at. Um, thank you also to everyone else who's donating and who's tuning in now, it's appreciated. Over to you for those, Michael, and then we'll do one more round after that. Well, piles of questions here, as you can tell, Matt, it's very difficult to answer all. Let's go, let's go straight in with China. My view is that uh, somebody says, is it a typically capitalist country? Well, I I have a maybe slightly different position from a lot of people. A lot of there's a group of people, well, the majority of people, I think, in the Labour movement, particularly uh, socialists, consider China just another capitalist power. Uh, just an even imperialist power like America or, or the European countries. And then there's a smaller group that consider China as an absolutely perfect socialist economy, which is progressing gradually towards socialism, despite the efforts of imperialism. My position is neither. I don't think that uh, China is a capitalist uh, e economy because the state controls the vast majority of investment decisions, uh, the big companies and so on. I don't think it's socialist because, from my view, as we just discussed in my lead off, socialism is a society where uh, there is full democratic discussion and control by working people, 
where there's a freedom of expression, where workers control the society. Uh, and that's not the case in China, where uh, the elite in the Communist Party controls all the decisions. Uh, but what we have seen from China, which makes it different, is that because it's basically a state-led planned economy, and was, has been since 1950, with varying degrees of amount of that, we've seen a dramatic transformation of that economy. Uh, I just ask viewers to think, I always say this to them, think about where India was in 1949, when it also had got independence from Britain, and the Chinese revolution in 1949, populations not dissimilar, China much poorer than India, even in 1949, and look where we are now in 2023, where there's no way that the per capita income or uh, level of living standards in India for the average person in India matches in any way what is happening in China. What is the reason for that? Is it because they're fantastically socialist? No. Is it because they're fantastically capitalist? No. It's because they have got a, a, where the capitalist mode of production is curbed and controlled and the state leads investment for the interests of public services and productivity and growth. So something like 900 million Chinese are now moved out of what was regarded as a policy level. That doesn't exist in India. So everybody's got to consider that why that question is. I can go into a lot more detail. I suggest you read again my blog. I have lots of posts on China, including those maps that's recently the developments that are taking place in China uh, for you to look at. For that. But let me move on to the multipolar issue. This is a big question for the 21st century. We've seen that the US is beginning to lose its dominant position in the world to make all the decisions. Although we can see over Ukraine, they're making all the decisions and Europe's going having to go along with it. But on the whole, the United States has increasingly found it difficult uh, to control the world and do what it did in the latter part of the 20th century in carrying out coups against any progressive government, uh, applying uh, reactionary regimes there, and uh, destroying the ability of working people to organize in those countries. It's much more difficult for the US now of the experiences we've seen in the 21st century, and it's losing its trade and its manufacturing uh, uh, dominance in the world to other countries. So it's opening up a multi-polar world, but it still dominates in certain areas. Key areas is the dominant international reserve currency in the world. Yes, that's declining a little bit, but not on the whole. 70% of all trade, investment, finance is done through the dollar. That makes it has it a powerful control over the finances of the world. I know when we looked at that graph, the banks, US banks weren't very big, but if you added on the FX reserves and the other financial factors, then the US is very big. And one other factor makes it even bigger, that its military expenditure and power is as big as the whole of the rest of the world's military expenditure and power, all the other countries put together. It's a dominant uh, military power. So although it's losing its economic dominance relatively, it still has financial and military dominance. But it does mean we are beginning to see the development of what you might call a multipolar world, where there are other powers in the world, not only China on the one hand, but other countries that don't want to go along with what US imperialism says, uh, in countries like Turkey, even India, um, countries like um, Indonesia, not so clear, and of course, uh, Russia. Russia is a weak economic power, if you look at that graph. It's dominated just by energy and so on. But of course, it sits uh, on the side of Eastern Europe after the struggles during the Second World War and the role of Stalinism there, that's left its mark upon the population of Eastern Europe who can fear it. Uh, uh, so just, just to finish, uh, I was in a debate with, um, well, I was in a discussion with fellow financiers, because remember I'm a financier, uh, that, uh, who, said to, who started off by saying, of course, what we've got to do is deal with the Soviet Union. And I thought, wait a moment, uh, we don't have a Soviet Union anymore. We just have Russia. The Soviet Union was crushed in 1990. And since then, we've had a series of, of uh, oligarchical governments now under P Putin. How can you talk about the Soviet Union? But in the minds of some people, particularly in the Western Europe and Eastern Europe, there is no difference between Putin's Russia and the Soviet Union of 1980s. And they see it the same. Uh, and that creates that, uh, that view, uh, which we, we've seen developed in the case of the Ukraine war. Well, there we are. We have a multipolar world, increasingly intense conflict between different powers. And the biggest 21st century conflict is going to be the development of a struggle between the US and China 
They would take the energy and train, and the hot spot for that would be what happens in Taiwan. Thanks, comrade. Um, I think they were this sort of themes people wanting to get into, and it's covered it well. Um, just a few plugs and bits before we go to the final questions. Um, thank you to the volunteers, as ever, for the free bends today for the streaming, the chat links and passing on the questions and locations to me. Um, thank you, everyone, for coming. If you can donate, please do. And also, please go to our partners Arises online rally on a day of action next week, which I think is lining up to be one of the biggest online rallies for some time. Mark Sawatka and others speaking it out on that day of massive industrial struggle here again in Britain. Now, there's a lot of questions and I, can't, I do apologise, we can't get them all. But the ones I'm going to go to now are more sort of theoretical, almost philosophical, and I'm just going to read them in, I think they're all related, so I'm just going to read them in the order I can see them on the screen. One is from Mary Fletcher here on Zoom, who says, does socialism entail a degree of widespread altruism that makes it unlikely to happen? Um, linked, very linked to that, is Jonathan Christie on Zoom. Are humans naturally selfish or if we take away capitalism? Does that change? Um, sort of linked to it and not is from Stan, which is in sort of governing circles, is Adam Smith's economic thinking still alive and kicking? Um, and then um, a lot of people are asking questions about how do we stop people believe? It's sort of linking back to the first question you asked, which is believing in capitalist propaganda, stopping splits in workers by um, nationalism or the media and other things. Um, then people asking also about the um, climate and socialism, if you could say a few bit more on that, although you did cover that in the presentation. So I think it's they're mainly about human nature yeah. and capitalism and selfishness, which is the question that along with, you know, what about Russia is the one we always get asked, isn't it? So I think that's a good place to end. So I'll hand back to you to sort of answer those and then we'll, we'll tie it up. As you say, Matt, but uh, the question you often get asked if you're talking at, um, in a pub or anywhere is informally with people about, you bring up socialism, and they say, well, you never get socialism because people are innately selfish. Uh, they're only interested in uh, getting one over the next person and making, making their lives better at the expense of other people. And I ask myself, well, yes, we know that that, that happens, but is it really true that people are are innately selfish? And is it not true that people also cooperate and help each other on many occasions, uh, even when it doesn't uh, mean that they gain anything from it in terms of money or advantage in any way? Uh, human beings have a tendency also to help each other. They're a cooperative social animal. They're also competitive in certain situations. And I think what the questioner added was that it depends on what the situations are, what sort of structural economy and society we've got, what forces us to compete rather than cooperate? Uh, what forces us to uh, take advantage of other people rather than help each other to improve conditions? If we change the objective conditions which enable people to uh, expand their cooperative and, uh, and uh, human social organization, which I think exists very strongly amongst humanity, uh, then we can also change that idea that everybody is selfish. Just to get the arm, ah, well, even if you had socialism, there's still going to be people who kill each other or, or rob each other. Uh, well, yes, there may well be people like that, but I can assure, I think if people think about it, they would think that the millions uh, or the hundreds of thousands that end up in jails at the moment wouldn't be in jail if we had a different organisation of society. They wouldn't be going out and sporadically shooting people discriminately in shopping centres and schools if we had a different sort of society. I don't think that's endemic or part of the endemic net culture of humanity. Uh, I think it's a result of the grotesque inequalities, grotesque uh, distortions which capitalism has produced in the psyche of some people. And it will be drastically reduced under a socialist system in my view. So I do have confidence that if you want to put it this way, that antagonism and competition can be replaced by love and cooperation if we have the socialist and social conditions that enable that to be possible. 
Thank you, Tommy. Thank you, everyone, for tuning in. And thank you for everyone who's donated as well. Um, I don't have any real closing notes here for me. Just to, please follow Labour Outlook and Michael's blog, please. Um, I would actually recommend to, to people Michael's brilliant book, I think, on Engels's contribution to political economy, which I read last year. But there's many other books he's written, which you can see there on his site. And please do uh, regularly read Labour Outlook as well. Um, as Ben said earlier, the next forum is not to the end of March, it's 20, just after the anniversary of the 20th invasion of the war in Iraq, with Sami Ramadani, an anti-war ca Iraqi campaigner who lives here, and Medea Benjamin, the well-known US peace campaigner. We also have one coming up in May about why Palestine, why socialists stand with Palestine with Bernard Regan, who many of you will know. And then um, if you can stomach it, I'm doing one on Hugo Chavez, 25 years since he was elected in July and why that was the spark for global socialism. Um, have you got anything else you want to add before we go, Michael? No, I'd just like to thank everybody for attending. I see we had quite a good attendance. I uh, apologise that I can't answer all the questions in detail. And I'm sure, as Matt said, there's lots of other questions that didn't get answered. I apologise for that in the time. Uh, but I would say that I had a quick look down the Q&A and I'd say just about every question that's been asked is dealt with in my blog in some posts somewhere <laughs> over the last 10 years. So do have a look. <laughs>